I would like to go ahead and introduce Frank Townsend, who will introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Julie Ann, very, very much. Well, today is a rare day when the stars really come out to shine. Um, it's only fitting to me that we conclude our Panama Canal ILIR presentation series because today is the 3rd of November, 3rd of November. This is Panama's Independence Day, so it's only fitting that we do. Uh, Judy Russell, Dean of the Libraries, is here with us. And uh, for your information, the U.S. Libraries is where the uh, Panama Canal Museum collection now resides. So thank you for being here, Judy, and appreciate you for being here. Um, our speaker, Joe Wood, and I'll introduce him in a few minutes, but his wife, Bev, is here. And so we recognize Bev, and they're down here from Tallahassee to make this presentation. Uh, you might have noticed from our ILIR Panama series that two weeks ago, I talked about the construction era, which was 1904 to 1914. And last week, John Nemers and Betty Bemis, Betsy Bemis responded about the World War II era. And today, Joe Wood is going to take us through the last 20 years of the American era from 79 to 99. And so we're going to go from beginning to the end of the American era as far as Panama Canal is concerned. Um, I first met Joe Wood in about 1954-55 in the Balboa High School band. Joe was a senior and he played the bass drum and I was a lowly freshman and I was third trumpet. But um, the great thing about being in the band is you transcended all four years and so the freshmen and the seniors got the mix and uh, Joe reminded me of that and when he signed my yearbook and I say, quote unquote, to remember the good times in the band. And so, thank you, Joe. I, I'm still remembering them. Um, Joe is a 1959 UF grad. And after he graduated, he finished his active duty service and then he returned to the canal zone, retiring in 93 from a position as director, office of executive administration. And so with that particular position, he saw it all. The treaty implementation of the Carter Torrijos Treaty, the years of Noriega, and Operation Just Cause that um, Daddy Bush operated on. But in 1999, he helped found the Panama Canal Museum, which was down in Seminole, Florida. And he was very, very instrumental in 2012 when the collection was transferred to the U.S. Smathers Library and where it now sits now. And he continues to chair the board of directors for the Panama Canal Museum. Um, he and Bev have been married for 50 years. They have three sons. Two have graduated from the University of Florida and they have four grandchildren. And so I am very, very, very delighted to introduce Joe Wood for what will be a very candid and a very, very unique presentation entitled a personal perspective of the 1979-1990 period of transition of the ownership of the canal. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate that introduction. <clears throat> and uh, Margaret, Julie, thank you all for having me here. I want to mention one real quick story. Back in 1959 as a UF student, it was the first year that women were allowed to wear Bermuda shorts. <laughs> Up to that time, they had to wear either long pants or dresses down below the knees. So that was historical. Anyway, I'd like to share a few thoughts about the Panama Canal today. Specifically, I'd like to talk about the sometimes stormy relations between the United States and Panama during the 20th century. While that history is well documented officially, I can perhaps provide some personal perspective regarding some of the dramatic events that occurred during the time that I was working in the canal. The Office of Executive Administration, which I headed up from 1980 to 1993, was a senior administrative and policy coordinating position and was charged with being the main channel of communication between the Panamanian government, the U.S. Embassy, the U.S. military, 
congressional delegations and the Panama Canal Board of Directors. So from that position, I pretty much had a front row seat on the political, military, and diplomatic developments in Panama. Canal history, of course, began with the 1903 treaty between Panama and the United States. In essence, that treaty granted the United States the exclusive right to construct, operate, maintain, and defend a canal, and to exercise jurisdiction in the canal zone as if it were sovereign. The zone was 10 miles wide and 50 miles long. And as you can see here, it essentially divided Panama into two halves exercising jurisdiction as if it were sovereign allowed the creation of an independent government in the canal zone and a completely sovereign U.S. judicial system with a police force, magistrate courts, a U.S. district court, jails, prisons, as well as other governmental functions such as post offices, customs and immigration, schools, libraries, hospitals, veterinary, optical and dental clinics, mortuaries, cemeteries, the entire gamut of governmental services. Panamanians entering the canal zone for any reason, even if they were just crossing from one side of their country to the other, were subject to US jurisdiction and could be apprehended, fined, or imprisoned if they happened to violate any canal zone laws. From the very beginning, the fact that Panama did not have jurisdiction or enjoy sovereignty over its own territory was a huge sticking point in its relations with the US. Panama was also greatly bothered by the relatively small amount of money that the US was paying for the use of its territory. The 1903 treaty called for an immediate payment of $10 million followed by annual payments of $250,000 beginning nine years later. Over time, that payment grew to $1,930,000, but compared to the hundreds of millions of dollars the U.S. was paying Spain, Germany, and Japan, that relatively small amount of money became a, a source of increasing resentment in Panama. As the years went by, Panama's demands for sovereignty over its territory, as well as much more money, became more vocal and increasingly more intense. Graffiti like this one, Johnson, you kill Kennedy. Yankees, killers, go home. And soberania or morte, which means, of course, sovereignty or death, were pretty widespread. On January 9th, 1964, in an effort to assert Panamanian sovereignty in the Canal Zone, a determined group of Panamanian students entered the Canal Zone with the intention of raising the Panamanian flag and a flagpole on the grounds of a local U.S. high school. The American students had already raised the American flag at that flagpole. So there was some confrontation developing. After an intense standoff, the Panamanian students were denied permission to fly their flag. And angered that their plans were thwarted, stormed back to Panama City, throwing rocks at cars and buildings on the way back. The flag incident, as it was called, ignited a spark that lit a fire and all that resentment that had been built up over 70 years had, had finally erupted in the form of widespread, violent, anti-American demonstrations. It lasted for days and caused the death of 21 Panamanians and four American soldiers. Large and unruly mob, mobs on the border began throwing rocks and Molotov cocktails into the canal zone and stopping cars and setting them on fire. <clears throat> My 18-year-old sister was coming into the canal zone from her home in Panama. 
And an angry mob surrounded the car, began shaking it, throwing rocks, breaking every window except the windshield. She feared for her life, so all she could do was choose to step on the accelerator, close her eyes, and get out of there. And she probably hit a bunch of people on the way out. And she was visibly shaken. Not everyone is lucky. We're so lucky. As you can see here, other cars belonging to Americans were stopped and set on fire. And that continued for several days. Panama was angered by the US military involvement and the killing of its citizens, so they reacted by breaking diplomatic relations. Relations eventually were stored on April 3rd, but only after the US agreed to negotiate a new treaty. Anti-American sentiments in Panama persisted, and for several years, Americans did not feel safe going into Panama. These types of images would appear frequently for the next several years. This one is a Yankee go home effigy. This one is self-explanatory, but you can see they didn't want the Zonians anywhere near Panama. After intense negotiations, 13 years later, on September 7th, 1977, U.S. President Jimmy Carter, bowing to intense international pressure, signed the Panama Canal Treaty, along with Panamanian dictator General Omar Torrijos. The treaty had some key elements. The first one was that the effective date would be on October 1st, 1979. On that date, the canal zone would be eliminated. Panama would regain complete jurisdiction and sovereignty over their own territory. <coughs> Panama would receive substantially more money than they had been receiving. There would be a 20 year transition period during which Panama would participate increasingly in the management of the canal and the US would prepare Panamanians for control and operation of the canal. At noon on December 31st, 1999, the canal and all its property, including US military bases, would be transferred at no cost and free of liens and debt to Panama. Panama pretty much got everything it wanted. The president of Panama at the time, Jimmy Lacas, confiding in one of my colleagues said, and I quote, Panama went into the treaty negotiations asking for the moon, expecting a piece of green cheese, but lo and behold, we got the moon. With the elimination of the canal zone on October 1st, 1979, there were two US government agencies one was the Panama Canal Company, and the other was the canal zone government. The company operated the canal. The government, of course, ran the governmental services in the canal zone. There was one governor slash president, governor of the canal zone president of the Panama Canal Company. And he operated, he ran both organizations. It was quite of a unique, a unique setup. The canal zone government under the treaty was completely dismantled and its functions were transferred. All the elementary schools, the high schools, the junior college were transferred to the Department of Defense dependent schools. Hospitals, clinics, mortuaries, and veterinary services were transferred to the MEDAC, Medical Department, US Army Medical Department. Post offices went to the Air Force APO system. Customs, immigration, and licensing activities went to Panama. Fire department units were transferred to Panama. Police, magistrate courts, the US district court, jails, and prisons continued under joint jurisdiction for two and a half years. That was joint US and Panamanian patrols and jurisdiction. 
After two and a half years, Panama took over complete control of that. With regard to the Panama Canal Company, most of its functions, including the canal operations, maintenance, engineering, supply and logistics, employee housing, and other canal related activities were retained and incorporated into the new Panama Canal Commission, which was the agency that took over for the next 20 years. The Panama Railroad was transferred to Panama and all commercial activities such as commissaries, clubhouses, movie theaters, retail stores were closed. Although the US employees of the canal had access to military privileges, PXs and commissaries for five years. And then after that, they had to purchase whatever they wanted off the Panamanian economy. Before the treaty, the two agencies, Canal Zone Government and Panama Canal Company had 8,000 employees. The new Panama Canal Commission had 3,500 employees. The treaty called for a US administrator and a Panamanian deputy administrator for the first 10 years. Then in 1990, those roles would be reversed with a Panamanian as head of the agency for the next 10 years. Lieutenant General D.P. McAuliffe, who on September 30th, 1979, was a commander in chief of the U.S. Southern Command in Panama. The very next day, October 1st, became the administrator of the new Panama Canal Commission. <clears throat> the elimination of the canal zone and the disestablishment of the two agencies resulted in tremendous upheaval within the workforce and had a dramatic and life-changing impact on the canal employees and their families. Many employees, both Panamanians and Americans, lost their jobs. Others were demoted or transferred to lower level positions. Still others were transferred with their jobs to the Department of Defense. Postal employees went to DOD, school teachers went to DOD, et cetera. Tensions ran high and morale hit rock bottom as thousands of employees and their families were uprooted and disenfranchised. To add to the shock, employees and their families were jolted by the reality of suddenly being subject to Panamanian jurisdiction. With completely different laws, police and court systems. In addition, they had to learn to deal with an unfamiliar Panamanian governmental bureaucracy in order to obtain Panamanian immigration residency and Panamanian immigration and residency documentation, driver's licenses, license plates, and all sorts of other governmental permits. In spite of all the turmoil, uncertainty, fear, and apprehension, along with the upheaval and disruption that affected the lives of all employees, the canal continued to operate without interruption, albeit with a period of inefficiency, while everyone adjusted to the new organization and, and conditions. In addition to achieving the goal of abolishing the canal zone, Panama also realized substantially, a substantial increase in payments. Under the treaty, Panama was to receive a fixed annuity of $10 million every year. A payment of 10 million a year for public services, which included police protection, fire protection, street maintenance, street lighting, street cleaning, traffic management, and garbage collection. Every year, $10 million. 30 cents per Panama Canal net ton for every ton that went through the transit, transit of the canal, adjusted for inflation. This was about 40 million initially and grew to more to 70 million later on in the treaty period. It should be noted that all of these payments came out of canal revenues. The US taxpayer was not charged with paying any of these funds. So in effect, the shipping industry covered these payments to Panama.
And then there was an additional $10 million for many net profits made by the canal each year. Because of that provision, the canal tried desperately to balance the budget every year so they wouldn't have to give extra money to Panama. In order to balance the budget, they would increase their uh, maintenance projects or capital improvements. So Panama got very little money from that provision. Here's what the new treaty map looked like. All the white areas were areas that were formerly the canal zone, but returned to Panama totally. The green and yellow were military areas of control. And the pink was the canal operating area where the canal had control of what went on in, the, in that area, but Panama had, of course, jurisdiction. Then there was a 20 year transition period. 20 year transition period under the treaty was, a lot, was designed to allow Panamanians to be trained and to gain experience. The experience needed to move up the ladder into supervisory and management positions. So that when the canal was transferred, they would be fully capable of operating the waterway. That goal was achieved and by 1999, with the exception of just a few US citizens, mostly canal pilots, the workforce was almost entirely Panamanian. Two years after the treaty went into effect, Panamanian dictator, General Omar Torrijos, died in a plane crash in the interior of Panama. With Torrijos gone, Colonel Manuel Antonio Noriega manipulated his rise to power and eventually became Panama's new de facto leader. Noriega proved over the years to be a ruthless dictatorial despot capable of the most despicable of crimes. Through the mid to late eighties, the canal continued with its goal of training and promoting Panamanians and preparing Panama to take over the canal. However, relations with Noriega and the Panamanian government gradually deteriorated, causing the, pan the canal considerable difficulty. In June, 1987, Colonel Roberto Diaz Herrera, Chief of Staff of the Panama Defense Forces, made some startling public accusations against Noriega that shocked the nation. He said that Noriega had rigged the 1984 presidential election, that he murdered and beheaded a political enemy, Dr. Hugo Spadafora, that he caused the death of Omar Torrijos, and that he was heavily involved in drug trafficking. As a result, for the next two and a half years until the end of 1989, when the US actually invaded Panama, the country was in constant turmoil. Protest marches, demonstrations, riots, nationwide strikes, road blockages, and other acts of civil disobedience against the Noriega regime occurred almost daily. To deal with these uprisings, Noriega created what he called dignity battalions, which were armed civilian thugs that roamed the streets, beating up and intimidating the opposition. Many of the frequent protest marches started out peacefully with people banging on pots and pans, waving white handkerchiefs. But each one of these was met with violence by the dignity battalions. The marchers, including women and children, were tear gas, clubbed with batons and rifle butts and shot at with many being killed. During one such march, opposition vice presidential candidate, Billy Ford, who incidentally was a classmate of mine in Balboa High School in the Canal Zone, was brutally attacked and beaten by his bodyguard, was killed. Here you can see the, the Panama Defense Force man up there in the upper right hand, just standing by watching as the beating took place. This image appeared on the cover of Time Magazine and it was quite a headline at the time. Because of this and other events that were taking place in Panama at the time, in March of 1988, two federal grand juries 
indicted Noriega on drug charges. Shortly after that, the U.S. imposed economic sanctions on Panama. These sanctions meant that all treaty mandated canal payments, as you saw earlier, along with payroll and income taxes withheld from the paychecks of Panamanian employees had to be stopped. They couldn't be paid to Panama. These funds, which total well over $100 million a year, were put into a bank in New York in escrow. As time went on, Noriega started to feel the pinch and needed money desperately to keep his government afloat. So one way he tried to put pressure on the U.S. to back off the sanctions was to arrest Panamanian employees for non-payment of their taxes because the U.S. was withholding their taxes and then torturing them while they were in jail. He also froze bank accounts of Panamanian employees, confiscated their property, denied them driver's license and license plates, thus preventing them from getting to their cars and they couldn't drive their cars, they had a hard time getting to work, and generally denied them their rights as citizens. And of course the canal and other US government agencies were greatly affected by this because employees had a hard time getting to their jobs as the payments dried up, Noriega retaliated by curtailing those treaty mandated public services. As a result, burned out street lights in the canal area were not replaced. Traffic signals stopped functioning, causing constant traffic disruption. Robberies, burglaries, vehicle thefts, home invasions and other crimes increased as Panamanian police stopped patrolling the canal area. Flies and rodents multiplied as garbage collection was curtailed. So the quality of life in the canal area, among American employees particularly, deteriorated dramatically, and residents were in constant fear for their safety and security. The economic sanctions also made it nearly impossible for Noriega to pay his own people. As money became scarce, people panicked and started pulling their money out of the banks. As a result, the entire banking system of the, of the country shut down. Every bank in the country was closed. People couldn't cash their checks, pay their bills, excuse me, or transact any business. As an extreme emergency measure, the canal had to fly in millions of dollars every month to cash employees' paychecks. And we also had to bring in hundreds of millions of dollars to pay the, to cash the retirement checks of over 10,000 employees who had retired and lived in Panama. The situation became so dire that in one instance, Panamanian employees of the Port of Balboa very close to the canal headquarters, angry about not being paid, put 40 foot containers in all access points to the canal area and effectively holding canal employees and residents hostage. After several hours, the Panamanian troops broke through the barriers, firing tear gas and shooting at the strikers, killing several of them. The area looked like a war zone. Again, canal residents and workers feared for their lives and the canal operations obviously were threatened. In another incident, Noriega ordered his troops to seize a US Navy contractor's school bus because it did not have the current year's license plates because Panama wasn't issuing license plates because the government, U.S. government wasn't paying them, their, giving them their money. The bus was full of American junior high school students and they were held hostage at gunpoint for several hours. The U.S. showed up, surrounded the school bus and surrounded the Panamanian troops and a U.S. helicopter hovered overhead while there was a tense standoff for an hour or so. Eventually the Panamanian troops backed down, 
ending a frightening and traumatic experience for the kids on the bus, one of which was my youngest son, who of course was greatly affected for some time after that. One night, my oldest son was with a group of American high school students at a discotheque in Panama City when a pack of these Dignity Battalion thugs, armed, came into the discotheque, rounded up all these American kids at gunpoint, took them outside and lined them up against the wall as if they were gonna shoot them. They were verbally abused, told to get out of the country. And when a couple of them protested, they were hit with the butt end of a rifle. This constant, excuse me, this constant harassment against Americans and Panamanians continued all the way throughout 1989 until the US actually took action. Almost every day there would be an incident of some kind to ramp up the pressure. Road blockages, bus strikes, bomb threats, protest marches, employees being arrested, etc. kept both Panamanian and US employees in a constant state of fear severely affecting their ability to get to work and adversely impacting canal operations. To add to the anxiety, in October of 1989, I received from a Panamanian Defense Force informer a hit list containing my name and the name of 25 other canal officials and employees who, along with their families, were to be kidnapped by Panamanian Defense Forces and held hostage to be exchanged in the event Noriega had, was captured and we would be pawns in the exchange. I took the list up to the Southern Command Headquarters, J2, and three weeks later they came back and said, yes, it was a valid list and a valid plan. They verified it. So in the canal, we took steps immediately to protect these particular people whose names was on that list. We installed steel doors in their houses, bars in the windows, and we gave them a direct phone line to the security office. All you had to do was pick it up and it would ring in the security office. As Noriega's harassment of Panamanian and American citizens increased, the Southern Command's commander in chief, General Fred Warner, began to draw up contingency plans for the crisis in case Noriega's behavior became more belligerent. In the fall of 1989, General Maxwell, Mad Max, they called him, Mad Max Thurman, replaced Werner as commander in chief. And he arrived just in time to witness an attempted coup by some Panama Defense Force officers. Noriega managed to brutally crush the attempted coup and in his own office executed the leader of that coup, Major Giraldi, by shooting him in the head. That aborted coup left Thurman convinced that the only, excuse me, only US military intervention could remove the dictator from power and plans were made for an eventual military action. The plan was codenamed Blue Spoon. As presented by Thurman to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Blue Spoon called for a surprise assault on over two dozen targets in Panama. The trigger event would be another coup attempt or the killing of a US citizen, or some other extreme provocation against US interests in Panama. An early morning attack would help achieve surprise, limit civilian casualties, and take advantage of US night fighting capabilities. The objectives of the operation would be to safeguard the lives of US citizens in Panama, defend democracy and human rights in Panama, combat drug trafficking, and protect the integrity of the Panama Canal Treaties. The plan was approved by the Joint Chiefs of Staff in November of 1989. Under Thurman, the US military stepped up the pressure on Noriega by conducting training exercises all around the country. They kept putting pressure on Noriega by doing that. And for all practical purposes, these exercises were dry runs for the invasion. The exercises were provocative and they enraged Noriega. As a result, on December 15th, 1989, Noriega and the Panamanian legislature 
declared a state of war against the United States. The next day, on Saturday, December 16th, a car carrying four U.S. Marines ran a Panamanian roadblock. The Panamanian Defense Forces opened fire, killing one of the Marines. His name was Lieutenant Robert Paz. That was a trigger event described in the, in the Blue Spoons plan that resulted in the invasion of Panama. On Sunday afternoon, December 17th, President George H.W. Bush was briefed on the incident in an Operation Blue Spoon. His decision was, okay, let's go. Shortly after that, Blue Spoon was given a more appropriate and a more noble name, Operation Just Cause. It was scheduled to begin at 0100 Panama time, Wednesday, December 20th, 1989. On Tuesday morning, December 19th, I accompanied the administrator to the American Embassy for a regularly scheduled weekly meeting of the top three U.S. officials in Panama. The administrator, the U.S. ambassador, and the commander-in-chief of the Southern Command. <clears throat> they had met every week for two years to discuss the situation in Panama. On this occasion, Ambassador Arthur Davis was no longer in country because he had been declared persona non grata. As we were about to enter the ambassador's office, General Thurman was walking out saying he couldn't attend the meeting. Something had come up that left the administrator to meet with the embassy's charge de affairs and the chief of staff. During the meeting, the discussion centered around the killing of Lieutenant Paz, the dangerous situation in Panama and the need for civilians to be alert. Nothing was mentioned about a planned invasion that night, even though both the charge and the chief of staff clearly knew it was coming. That night around 12.35 a.m., my wife and I were awakened to the sound of gunshots very close to our residence. I immediately called the chief of staff with whom we had met earlier, told him about the gunshots and asked him if he knew what was going on. He said, I don't know what that is. We haven't started our thing yet. And I said, what is our thing? And he answered, I can't tell you because this is not a secure line. So I called the administrator and told him what the chief of staff told me. He said that the chief had called him at 12.30 to let him know about the imminent invasion and invited the administrator and his wife to go to a secure tunnel on a military reservation for their safety. McAuliffe told him that he wasn't going anywhere and demanded to know why he hadn't been told in advance about the invasion. He was a former commander chief of the Southern Command retired Lieutenant General and the head of the U.S. agency responsible for the safe operation of the Panama Canal, and he wasn't told in advance about the invasion. He obviously was furious that he was kept out of the loop. As we approached 1 a.m., the shooting became more intense and closer to our house. I told my wife and son, get dressed, put on your sneakers, and let's get ready to escape in the event they come for us to try to kidnap us. About that time, an 18-wheeler carrying a large container pulled up in front of our house. The back end opened up, troops piled out and ran toward our house and surrounded it. We didn't know if they were American or Panamanian troops. My neighbor called and said our house was surrounded, but couldn't tell whether they were American. After about an hour, I didn't hear anything. I opened the door slightly and I heard, get back in your house, sir. You bet. <laughs> we were very happy that that, uh, that happened. And apparently in their planning, the US military had provided protection for for all the people on that hit list. And we're all grateful for that. 
Soon thereafter, our middle son, who was at a party for about 200 college age students, who were most of them returning home for Christmas for the holidays from the States, he called very shaken, hoping that we hadn't been kidnapped. We reassured him we were safe and told him to stay where he was. The party was in a neighborhood that had one way in and one way out. And when the bombings and shootings started, some of them wanted to get home. Fortunately, some quick thinking parents blocked the exit and kept all the kids there. Unfortunately, two American dependents managed to get past the parents' roadblock and tried to, to get home. On the way, they came upon a US military roadblock. Not knowing if they were US or Panamanians, they ran the roadblock and the US soldiers fired on the car, killing one boy and injuring the other. As it turned out, those other 200 kids stayed there for a couple of days in the neighborhood, families and friends put them up for a couple of nights because they couldn't get home at least for two days. In another incident, about an hour before the invasion was to begin, one of our very close friends, an American school teacher, became the first casualty of the invasion when she was shot and killed while driving home from a dinner party with her husband. <clears throat> it is believed that a Panamanian soldier, seeing that the US troops were getting into position for the invasion, opened fire into the first car he saw and unfortunately, she died. Later, it was learned that another friend, a US professor at the college, <clears throat> was brutally murdered by members of the Dignity Battalion as they roamed the streets looking for Americans to kill. Those thugs also found a young Panamanian employee of the US Embassy and killed him just because he worked for the US. Needless to say, the night was fearsome and chaotic with live fire and explosions going on until dawn. The US forces had virtually destroyed all the Panamanian Defense Forces communication centers and facilities and had taken control of the harbors and airports to prevent Noriega from escaping or allowing reinforcements to come in from other parts of the country. This is one of Noriega's police stations it was about a quarter of a mile from our house, and it was bombed by these helicopter gunships. The noise was terrifying. One of the US forces main targets was Noriega's headquarters in Panama City, which was located just outside the border of the canal zone. It was located in a highly populated area with high rise buildings all around it. This is another view of the police station. And this is some of the damage on Noriega's headquarters. All the residents of those buildings had to evacuate because of fires and shooting. By dawn, the entire area was ablaze, displacing thousands of Panamanian citizens who came into the canal zone to get away from the devastation. It was heartbreaking to see the hordes of people as they swarmed past the residential areas where we lived. Some in wheelchairs, old people and children were being carried, most of them dazed, crying, scared, not knowing what hit them. My neighbors and I watched helplessly as thousands of people congregated in the streets and migrated into our yards and around our houses, drinking from our garden hoses washing themselves and begging for food. There was little we could do to help them until the US military started to round them up and take them to the local high school where the flag incident started back in 1964 and took them to the stadium where they took care of them there in this tent city. The city lasted for several months while well, they decided what they could do with these displaced persons. The US military provided food, clothing, and medical care, of course, until they could be relocated. 
For several days after the invasion, the few Panamanian soldiers who had not been captured or surrendered continued to resist by firing mortars and other incendiary devices into the military bases and into the civilian areas. The insurgents were finally shut down and for all practical purposes, by December 22nd, two days after it started, the combat portion of the Operation Just Cause had ended. At eight o'clock on December 25th, Christmas morning, I was called into a meeting with the Canal Administrator and Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney, who was in Panama, to evaluate the aftermath of the invasion. During that meeting, Administrator McAuliffe expressed to Cheney in no uncertain terms his displeasure and anger at not being informed in advance about the invasion. He told Cheney that there had been a ship carrying liquid petroleum gas in one of the canal's locks at the time of the invasion, where mortars and other incendiaries were landing very close by. Had it been hit, the resulting explosion would have closed the canal indefinitely and would have taken out part of the U.S. Army military headquarters that was near the locks. Had he known in advance, McCullough said he could have taken measures to ensure that the locks were cleared of any vessels carrying hazardous cargo. He also expressed his disbelief that as a former commander in chief of the Southern Command and the senior United States official of the Panama Canal that the military chain of command would choose to keep him out of the loop. Several years later, McAuliffe testified before Congress to the same effect. Although nothing was done about it, he at least got his, uh, his anger expressed on the record. The overwhelming success of the Operation Just Cause can be attributed to meticulous and in-depth planning, and in part to the fact that the Panamanian Defense Forces did not put up much of a resistance. Many abandoned their posts as the invasion got underway, and as a result, the resistance was put down in a matter of hours with few American casualties. Had they been more formidable, the cost of the invasion in both lives and property, of course, would have been much greater. One major glitch in the execution, as determined later, was a complete breakdown of law and order throughout Panama. The Panamanian police force was almost completely decimated the result was incredible chaos, panic, and widespread looting throughout the country. Businesses were completely gutted, supplies of food and other staples quickly dried up, and people across the country became desperate for basic needs. It took the U.S. military several days to mop up the resistance before they could focus on restoring civil authority throughout the country. This is a lesson learned for the U.S. military that they have to be prepared to assume civilian control once they destroy the civilian authority. And I think in Iraq, that same thing happened. They they'd failed to, to have that control for a while. Incredibly, in spite of the invasion, and the ensuing chaos, a canal operation was interrupted for only 18 hours, the first time in its history that it had been closed. This was a remarkable achievement considering employees face enormous obstacles, including lack of public transportation, military roadblocks, constant looting, a devastated economy, and the fact that many of them had been displaced from their homes. In retrospect, just keeping the canal open for the two years since the crisis began was a major accomplishment. Considering the civil unrest, the deteriorating quality of life for canal employees, and the constant harassment of Panamanian employees by Noriega. The dedication and loyalty of all U.S. employees and all Panamanian employees were unquestioned and greatly appreciated by canal management. At the end of the month, 
the Canal Administration changed on January 1st, 1990, with a Panamanian administrator taking over the head, the organization, and a U.S. deputy administrator guiding the canal through the next 10 years of operation. Panama returned to a democratic form of government and for the first time in many years enjoyed a stable political environment. On December 31st, 1999, President Jimmy Carter presided over the transfer ceremony in Panama as he witnessed a smooth transition of ownership and control of the waterway. <clears throat> in my opinion, not enough credit has been given to the United States for its considerable efforts during the 20 year transition period to ensure that a safe, efficient and fully functioning canal with a highly skilled and well-trained workforce was transferred to Panama in a smooth and seamless manner and for showing how a large and powerful nation can deal fairly and magnanimously with a small country. I can say that I enjoyed my career with the Panama Canal. It was a wild ride. And there were times when I wasn't sure we would get through it. But I wouldn't trade the experience for anything. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you. Wow, what a unique presentation. My goodness, Joe. Thank you. Um, what happened to the widening of the canal? Well, the canal was widened several times over the years since it was first constructed in the 50s and again in the late 80s, early 90s. But when Panama took over, they created a third set of locks which was much wider and much longer and much deeper. So the large container vessels could transit. The US didn't do that expansion. That was done under Panamanian control. Uh, that was just incredible. I really, really learned so much. Um, the one, uh, one of the many questions I would have if I could have you for the next 24 hours uh, is, when um, did Noriega, when was he taken out of Panama? Um, was it during this too? I'll, I'll let you answer. Um, actually, I was prepared for that question. <laughs> I had to do a little research. He was captured on January 3rd, 1990. He was found in the Vatican embassy and the u.s tried to roust him out of there he wouldn't leave so they started playing hard rock metal songs blasting them into the vatican for days all night all day long finally he relented and the u.s took him out he was sentenced to 40 years in the by the US. He was taken to the United States, oh. indicted, and sentenced to 40 years for drug trafficking in 1992. He served 17 years of those 40, then was returned to Panama to serve three consecutive 20 year sentences. He didn't last. He had a brain tumor in, in, in 2017 and died. So he never served his full sentence. He was also indicted by France for drug trafficking, but he never served time in France. He was extradited back to Panama and uh, he was under house arrest most of the last few years of his, of his life. Any more, any more questions? What about people? Oh, Will? I see Kathy. Joe, thank you for a great talk. I have a question about uh, your comment about the fact that things got kicked off in the beginning by the lack of money going to the Panama Canal Zone. 
And you mentioned uh, they were upset about seeing money go to Germany, Japan, and Spain. Yes. I understand Germany and Japan, I think, because of World War II, uh, rebuilding Marshall Plan monies and that sort of thing. Was the money to Spain, the money associated with the Spanish bases program to give us Air Force bases and a naval base in Spain, or was there some other reason? Exactly. The money I'm talking about was only for the U.S. bases in those countries. Okay, I, I appreciate that because I was part of uh, that buildup. Any more questions? Is there anybody on Zoom that has a question? I don't see any questions on chat or any of our Zoom participants. Any final comments, Frank? I know it's been a wonderful series. Oh, it, it's a magnificent. I'm happy to see Kathy Eagle up in the in the background there. Hello, <laughs> Kathy. <laughs> We're seeing yeah. Kathy. Kathy, by the way, is also with Joe, very, very instrumental in the uh, museum, in the museum library system. But there's no more questions. I'm glad we documented some history. Um, this is a very, very unique presentation for sure. And I thank you very, very much, Joe. You're welcome. My pleasure.